Welcome back. My name is Larry Benko, call sign W0QE, and this video is about designing crystal filters and the selection and measuring of the crystals for the filters. But before we begin, it's important to discuss what is or isn't special about a crystal filter, and do they have any advantages or disadvantages compared to filters that are designed with inductors and capacitors only. Here's a little comparison. Let's go through the bad stuff first. Crystal filters typically are very low power, a watt at the absolute max, and that is expected not to be dissipated in the crystals. Designing the crystal filter involves sorting crystals, sorting, selecting, whatever you, words you want to use, but somehow uh, coming up with crystals uh, that are a, more alike than might be obtained by just random selection. Only bandpass and band stop types of filters are available. You have limited choices in the frequency that you can have, unless you're willing to go to a crystal manufacturer yourself and have a specific frequency made. Generally, the filter will not be a 50 ohm terminated filter, so you'll need to match to it. And they're very narrow band. Now, you could say very narrow band is a, is a good and a bad thing, but they're very narrow band, which means if you want something wider, um, then maybe say 10 or 15 kilohertz, you can't get it with a crystal filter. On the other hand, they have some good points. And one of the most, one of the best points and probably one everyone knows about is crystals have extremely high Q. And because of that, they make high Q filters. High Q filters have good selectivity. They have, they can be made narrow band, which is a, both a con and a, you know, and a pro. But the reason I use them primarily is they can make good test equipment great. And I'll go through a couple examples of what they can do. But a filter in front of a reasonable spectrum analyzer can make measurements um, that rival some of the very best spectrum analyzers. And for example, this graph shows the response of a, of a six pole 20 meter filter and four frequencies that we're going to put into the filter. We really want only two frequencies to go into the filter, F1 and F2, but these two frequencies were created due to amplifiers, nonlinearities, whatever, in the process of combining these two signals. This is classic intermodulation distortion. These are the third order products. They're two times one of the frequencies minus the other frequency and vice versa. There's fifth order products, seventh order, ninth order. But if we were to put these two frequencies, this one and this one, through this filter, along with their pro well, along with the spurious products, the fundamental frequencies would be attenuated by about three and a half dB. However, this spurious product will be would be attenuated by about 51 dB, and this one be, would be attenuated even more by about a little bit more than 60 dB. So what that does is that takes a signal which we would create, which had good IMD, let's just say, I mean, good 60 dB below the carrier is 66 dB below, 66 dB IMD according to the ARRL method of measuring things. And you might say that that's really good, and it's good for an amplifier, it's not very good for a receiver. And maybe I want to use this signal to test the front end of a, re of a receiver, maybe I want to use this signal to test some small preamp which is exactly what I needed to do recently when I was doing some work for a small preamp that connected to a vertical, short vertical antenna that we drive around town looking for noise. And I needed this little preamp to be um, very tough because you have no idea if you drive by radio stations or whatever, uh, you don't want signals to be produced uh, due to the presence of these strong, um, strong out-of-band signals. So I, I needed a way to test this. And this is exactly what I ended up doing. I created the best, sig the best two signals I could create, which had the IMD down, it actually was down more than 60 dB, it was down more like 70. I ran it through the filter and it basically vanished. And then I was able to use um, a, a good spectrum analyzer, uh, basically, and, and make the measurements. Because uh, the, you know, the, signals, the, the signals were perfect pretty much going into the device under test. So that's one way of doing it, um, of, doing, of using a crystal filter to, um, 
to Im improve a piece of equipment. In this case, the piece of equipment you're improving is the device that uh, combined the two signals uh, from two signal generators. We could also take and generate a carrier frequency that is outside of the crystal filter, and we could look just here with a spectrum analyzer. So we could generate a monstrous signal out here, and we could measure phase noise of, a, of an oscillator. So if we had a signal out here that was um, 100 dB below, um, above the expected phase noise, we couldn't see it with most normal spectrum analyzers. Certainly some of the newer ones we c you could, but the best spectrum analyzer I have is an 8560E, and it won't do that kind of a level. Um, basically, if I wanted to look at something like the phase noise of my K3, I need to look at 150 dB, basically, below the, below the carrier. With a, with a setup like this and a crystal filter, I can easily take a reasonable quality spectrum analyzer and look at phase noise that's 150 dB down. Now, the carrier is way outside of the passband, and, but that's okay. And what it means is I have to move my frequency. Since the passband is fixed, I have to move my carrier frequency. But again, it's one of the small things you give up by, you know, but I didn't have to buy a very expensive spectrum analyzer in order to be able to make this measurement. So in my case, the ability to take reasonable quality equipment and make it better is the primary reason that I've built a bunch of crystal filters. And I have notch filters and bandpass filters for several of the amateur radio bands and a, and a couple places outside the amateur radio bands too that I use periodically. So they don't get used an awful lot, but they, they do get used occasionally. And of course, the other reason for a crystal filter is if you're building a receiver and you want to use it for selectivity. That's, that's probably the most common reason. Nevertheless, all these are the same application for crystal filter, the same design process takes place and everything else. So let's continue. The orange trace here on the Smith chart is the result of a crystal that was marked 14.318 megahertz. It's a different crystal than the previous example where I had a 14.056 megahertz uh, filter. This, is what, this one was marked 14.318 megahertz, which is the fourth harmonic of the TV color burst frequency in, in North America. And I measured it with my AIM 4170 with a small fixture. I calibrated very carefully. And all that was uh, described in the video I did, video number 10, in the basic series, which was titled Making Accurate RF Measurements, discusses uh, calibration and ways to see if your analyzer is accurate and how to, how to improve your accuracy of your measurements. But assuming you do that kind of stuff, this is the result of a, of a crystal. It's a two-terminal measurement. Crystal's got two terminals. We measure it with our network analyzer. And this has been contrived a little bit in that I made some quickie measurements so and I made sure I got the series resonant point on the crystal, I got the parallel resonant point on the crystal, and I got a few kilohertz on either side. So um, that's the only contrivance I did. Then I, once I figured out where uh, the starting and stopping points were to be in the analyzer, I scanned it at 10 hertz steps, which took a couple minutes. And this is the resultant plot. So the next thing I'm going to do, you notice here, first of all, since the crystal was marked 14.318 megahertz, um, and this is set, I set a generator up at 14.318. This is the dot from the generator. That is not the resonant point. So we need to determine where the resonant point is of this crystal. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the comparison of the graph from the scan file to an equivalent circuit, which is well known. Pretty much everybody has seen a circuit for a crystal, which is comprised of a capacitor, an inductor, and a resistor. And in, in that the whole mess is in parallel with, a, with another small capacitance value. This capacitance and this inductance and this resistance are the piece of quartz that's in the crystal. And these are sometimes called the emotional capacitance, emotional, the emotional inductance. And if we don't want to use R here, we can include it in, in one of these components and it becomes the Q. We can leave it out here. It doesn't matter. Basically, what I've done here is I know the frequency, and, th and these two components determine a series resonant point. I will go here, and I will figure out this, this series point here. I will add a couple points here, and I will figure out the parallel resonant point, and I will fix these values to give me the same curve that the 
um, scan did. Now, everybody probably says, gee, there's more than four parameters in a crystal. And yes, there are. People talk about seven different parameters. But unfortunately, or fortunately, they are not all independent. People talk about F sub S, which is a series resonant frequency. They talk about F sub P, which is a parallel resonant frequency, which is over here on this graph. Talk about RS, which is a series resistance. They also talk about Q, and Q and the series resistance are tied together very closely once you know the emotional inductance. People talk about the emotional inductance, or L sub S, the emotional capacitance, or C sub S. They talk about the parallel capacitance. So we have seven different terms, but there's only four different degrees of freedom. Let's close this off for a moment here, and let's see what we can do to make this match. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to come up here, and I've already got this set to be uh, 10 hertz steps when I move the mouse wheel. So I'm going to move, move the mouse wheel until I get pretty close here. And let's see, move one hertz steps now. That looks pretty close. So it actually had a series resonant point 78 hertz above what was marked. It could have been way off because the crystal could have been a parallel resonant crystal, but it turned out it wasn't. And I'll discuss that um, shortly. We also need now a couple points here and here that we're going to use to determine all the rest of the components. So a good, a good way to do that is just to put two frequencies, one a kilohertz above the series resonant point and one a kilohertz below as a starting point. So I'll click here, and I can go up and edit up here now, which is something I described, I believe, in a couple videos ago that that's a new feature. We'll put 14.317078, which is one kilohertz below. 14.319078, which is one kilohertz above. And let's see what that gives us. Okay, it gives us two points. Those are good. Now we need to go figure out what the parallel resonant frequency is. And we can do that in a minute. But in the meantime, let's, let's put some values in this crystal uh, circuit, this equivalent crystal circuit, and see if we can make these three points match this circuit. So we have, a, we, have two gener we have two generators in this circuit. They're cloned, but this load impedance is zero because this impedance from here isn't going to be exactly what that impedance is there if we do a good job of matching. We know that the starting frequency of, of uh, what the crystal is marked with is probably the best choice you have. I just put 10 ohms for a resistance because 10 seems like a reasonable number and based on stuff I've, figured, I've seen in the past. For the emotional capacitance, I put 10 femtofarads, which is a little bit on the low side for most of the crystals I've seen, but it's in the range, and 4.5 picofarads for the parallel capacitance. And then these values are calculated on these. So let's look at what we get for our, um, for our equivalent crystal. Well, it's off. We know it was going to be off because this is not the right frequency. 14.318 is not the, uh, not the resonant frequency, series resonant frequency. So let's change that to 078. That's good. Now, the crystal circuit here is too high of resistance. So let's drop our resistance down here. Let's zoom in a little bit and see how we're doing. That's pretty darn close. Okay, now up here, notice that the, that the green and the orange circles don't line up. It turns out since they've moved further away from the series resonant point, it means the emotional capacitance is too low. So let's increase the emotional capacitance. And if you don't know what this means when you're doing this, you just, just change it, see what happens. So I'm increasing the emotional capacitance and I'm seeing these more of an agreement now between the scanned image, the scanned measurement, and the measurement from the uh, equivalent circuit. Those two match now very closely. The last thing to do now is to go over here and get both of these to match. So let's turn, let's turn this off again, and let's figure where the parallel resonant frequency of the crystal was um, in the scan. So let's put another number up here. We know it's higher than this frequency, so let's say maybe 14.05 maybe. Let's see where that puts us. That's not very close. I hope I did something wrong there. Yeah, 
That was below where I scanned. I'm sorry. 14 point, I meant to say 14.35. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, that's pretty close. So, look how ratty things get when you get that, when you get that close. So I haven't done a lot of averaging or anything, but let's move. Now, the reason I, I did this for a reason. The, if you move the mouse wheel and you have more than one value in here, only the last one gets changed. So that's why I did it in this order. So I'm going to go over here now and I'm going to start moving. You should see the, you see the orange circle move as I'm moving. In, I'm only moving in 10 hertz steps. So it's taken a little while to get there. Hey, 14.35054. That looks, uh, maybe that's a little too high still. Let's drop it. Hard to say. Let's call it 14.3505. 14 point, 14 point that looks pretty close. Now let's turn the other cur curve back on. We need to make this point move up to there. And that's controlled by the parallel capacitance. So let's now move the parallel capacitance up here. Now four, four picofarads is too little. 4.1, 4.2, so it's somewhere in 4.15 range maybe. That's probably close enough. I and mean, I've zoomed in here so far, it's ridiculous. If I zoom out, you see that everything lines up. These line up very, very closely now. So we can we can say with a pretty high degree of confidence that the circ that the crystal we measured matches this crystal with those values. And I I calculated the emotional inductance, and this turns this crystal turns out to have a Q of eighty thousand. Taking a quick diversion here. This Sim Smith file is exactly the same as the previous one, with the exception of an additional block here, U1, and an additional isolation block, which shows the reported parameters that the 4170 or the AIM 4300 uh, report directly in software. The software is capable of calculating the crystal parameters itself. And this is, these are reported values. If you're making a lot of crystal measurements, this is a real uh, convenient feature. It will save these parameters in a, in a file which increments automatically and you just put crystal after crystal after crystal in and it increments the file uh, sequentially and it, it saves all the values and which, which makes it a lot easier to compare uh, the parameters when you're done. However, this software reports slightly um, underestimates the value of C sub S. Notice the uh, blue uh, circles here relative to the orange ones. The, re the value really is a little bit too low here. And uh, these values are a little more closer to reality. Notice it gets R sub S extremely close. It gets the capacitance very close, but it's a little bit low on C sub S. And it could be improved just a little bit here. Um, however, it is very good. The, these uh, parameters were obtained by running it in the high Q mode, which does more points and takes a little bit longer than the low Q mode. And it was using software version 9.10B, which is the current software. Anyways, enough of that. Uh, but uh, that's a very convenient way uh, to make the measurements quickly. Earlier, I made reference to the fact that there were two types of crystals. Crystals designed to be used at their series resonant frequency and crystals that were designed to be used at their parallel resonant frequency. And this example shows the difference between the two crystals. On the left here, we have a series resonant crystal with the, with the standard model. And I've just put values in here that are pretty similar to what we measured in the last example, but I rounded all the numbers off just for convenience. And over here, I have the exact same crystal, except I put 22 picofarads for the parallel capacitance. The reason being, in a, in a parallel resonant mode, and when you buy that, you buy it for an expected load impedance. So this crystal would have been manufactured for an 18 picofarad load. That's 18 additional picofarads of parallel capacitance across the crystal terminals. And other than that, they're identi identically the same crystal. This crystal is still four picofarads internal parallel capacitance. It's just 18 picofarads external. However, that does change the circuit. So if we look at the series resonant crystal here first and plot it, what we see is this. I chose not to do the dots like I had done before where I needed more accuracy. SimSmith was never designed to be used for crystal type calculations, although it works quite well. 
the markers only um, display frequency to three decimal places. I've got my I have my parameters set um, or excuse me my preferences set for five digits, but it still only displays three here. Notice five uh, or maybe I have set for six because it's displaying more digits here, but this will only display three. Also, if I drag if I click on the line anywhere, the point down here only shows to three. This is absolutely not enough resolution to do the crystal measurements. However, it's plenty to show this example I'm doing right now. So that's why I uh, did it differently before. I didn't mention that earlier. So if we look at this one, for this crystal, series resonant point at 14.318 megahertz, just as it's designed, right there, and a parallel resonant resonance at 14.35 megahertz, as we saw before also. Now let's look at the second crystal. The second crystal which is exactly the same as the first crystal, but it has the additional 18 picofarads across it, has a series resonant frequency that's still 14.318. Actually, it's moved about 10 hertz or 20 hertz or something, but it's very, very close to the, to the first crystal. But its parallel resonant point is 14.324 megahertz as opposed to, to 14.35. This crystal, which is the second crystal here, is intended to be used with the parallel with the, with the parallel load of four, 18 picofarads, it would be marked as a 14.324 megahertz crystal. It probably wouldn't say 18 picofarads on the case. It would just be marked this way. So if you looked at it, you would never know that it was really a 14.324 megahertz crystal intended for parallel mode operation. And you would look at it and you say, well, it's six kilohertz off in frequency. Well, it's not. It's the same. It's the same 14.318 megahertz crystal you use in a series mode. It's just that the intended use was in parallel, and because of that, they stamped a different frequency on it. So that happens, and it happens all to, a lot. Most accurate oscillators run in a series mode. However, most microprocessor type oscillators and many um, other electronics that have a built-in oscillator and an intended crystal that just plugs into them run in a parallel mode. And because of that, there's an awful lot of parallel mode crystals out there. So anyways, they're the same crystal. They're marked differently, but but they're the same crystal internally. So anyways, that's probably, um, probably enough of that uh, topic. All right, let's try to see if we can simulate a crystal filter. I know there are programs out there that do this job directly for crystals, but let's try to use LC and see what happens. LC is a program that comes with a handbook. It's free uh, for seventh order filters and below. For filters above that, uh, it has a nominal price. This, this version, I think, is good for order up to 22 or something. But uh, we don't need that many to, to demonstrate uh, what I want to do. We need to start with a topology that we think Crystal would work. And let's look at some of the topologies that LC gives us. If we look at topology like the nodal cu capacitor coupled bandpass filter, we end up with parallel resonance circuits here. Series resonance circuits are really what we want to use uh, for crystal filters. So this is not a good topology. We try this topology. It's got the same thing. It just had replaced the capacitors with inductors. Not good again. This topology. This would be a good candidate for crystal. These are not. Okay, next one. Same thing again. Seri these two would be good for crystal. This is not. Get down to here, and this is the, this is the model that works. There's a crystal, another crystal, another crystal, and some capacitors. This model is typically the circuit that's used for crystal filters. Now there are other circuits that are used too, but this is an extremely common one. Let's use that one and continue on. So we'll set that to be our um, topology we want to use. Let's design a filter. Uh, let's make it a chubby chef filter, and Let's set the center frequency, since we've been using 14.3 megahertz, let's continue to use 14.3 megahertz. Let's set a bandwidth that's very large. Let's set this bandwidth to be um, 1.43 megahertz. That's 10% of the center frequency. And let's set this to be an order 5, uh, let's see, an order 5, or let's make an order 7 filter and see what happens. 50 ohm termination. and a passband ripple. Now in a Chebyshev filter, uh, the higher the passband ripple, the higher the SWR in the passband is. So let's set this fairly low, say like point, um, let's say 0.1 dB. 
And let's see what the schematic looks like. There's would be one crystal, two crystals, three crystals, four crystals, five crystals. That's too many crystals. Way too many. So let's go back to the design and let's make it a fifth order and see what that looks like. One, two, three, four, five. And there's the load. Okay, this would work for, for a five crystal filter. But if we look at these, we see 22 picofarads and 6.3 microhenries. These values do not look at all like the crystal. The crystal had like seven millihenries here, a thousand times more, and it had 22 femtofarads here, a thousand times less. So there's something desperately wrong with uh, using crystals to, to generate this filter. And obviously, it should have been the fact that the bandwidth was 1.43 megahertz. Let's plot that nevertheless and see if we can get this straightened out here. So let's plot, say, from like uh, 12 megahertz to, say, um, 14, 15, 16 megahertz. See what happens. We're going to have to go more than that even. 18, 18, 18 megahertz. Uh, that's 4 above. 10 megahertz here. And let's set the inductor, since this is going to be a regular LC filter now. Um, 200 for the 200 for the inductors, and let's say 2,000 for the capacitors for Q, and we want to plot it on a 50 ohm scale. Let's see what that looks like. And that shows a filter. Pretty nice looking filter. It shows the typical shape that we'd expect to see for the mesh coupled uh, network. A uh, little faster roll off on the high side that we see on, than we see on the low side, and. That's good, but that's for a bandwidth that's fairly wide. So if we look at the bandwidth here, this is 13.5 megahertz, and this is 15 megahertz. So 1.6 megahertz, 1.5, 1.6 megahertz. So that's that's good. So now let's see what we can see what we can do if we narrow the bandwidth down. And the passband loss, by the way, here is 1. Uh, 1.6 dB. And if we want to plot um, SWR with this at the same time, we see that the SWR is pretty low. Notice the SWR rises to a, a maximum of looks like about 1.32 to 1. Let's go back to the design real quickly and change something. Let's change this to be a little bit lower number. This will mean our skirts are not quite as steep, but it means that our passband SWR now is 1.2 to 1 instead of 1.3 to 1. I don't know. <clears throat> Let's leave that alone and see what happens. So, moving, moving back to the design stage here, Let's drop the bandwidth down here. Let's drop the bandwidth down here by a factor of 10 to 143 kilohertz. And let's plot that. Let's look, look at the schematic. We see the capacitors dropped. Two picofarads now from 20 to 22, 55 microhenries. We're going in the right direction to get to where this will look like a crystal eventually, but we're not there yet. And let's plot it. And look what we see. Unfortunately, with the cues we have for the inductor, we are stuck with loss that in the passband loss, we're going to see a loss of 15 dB. This is probably unacceptable. And there, herein lies the dilemma and why I said in the beginning that the narrow bandwidth was a problem. Uh, it, was a pro, it was a pro and a con both the crystal filter. The crystal filter, this is way too wide for a crystal filter, and this is getting to be too narrow for an LC, fil an LC filter. And uh, for if you want a filter that's this narrow, you cannot build a conventional LC type filter. You need to do some lightly coupled tank type stuff um, to make it happen. But again, this is still way, way, way far away from being what we can do for a crystal filter. Let's move on and, and get continue on, on the road here for a crystal filter. Let's drop this down to 14.3 kilohertz and see what happens. 14.3 kilohertz, everything else staying the same. And let's see what we get. Schematic now says 0.2 picofarads. We're still not there. We're still an order of magnitude away from what a crystal is. But let's plot this. Now look at our passband. Our passband is 80 dB down. This is never going to work. So what do we have to do that's different? Well, if we think we're going to eventually get to where crystals will work, we are allowed to change the Q now. So let's make the Q be big. And let's make the Q of our inductor be 80,000. And let's make the Q of the capacitor be, um, say, 10 million. Uh, this, all the Q, all the, all the um, 
um, Q for the crystal is just going to be contained in the inductor, and that's a perfectly valid way of doing it. Now let's plot that. Now we see very narrow. We're going to have to fix our, our range, and our, but we see our loss is no longer um, 80 dB down. So let's go back here and set our frequency to be 14.3, um, let's say point, let's say, let's just say, let's just say 14 to 14.5 and see what happens here. Did something wrong there. 14 megahertz. And we see our passband loss is pretty good. So we'd be, we'd be in pretty good shape here if we could get our crystal filter to work. But the um, values that are chosen here are not good enough yet. Um, this is, not, this is not, not the values we're going to see in a crystal. So let's go back to the design stage again, and let's drop this down even more. Now, I don't want to drop it down another order of magnitude. I want to build a crystal filter at, say, about 4 kilohertz wide. So <clears throat> let's put 4 kilohertz there and just see what we get. At 4 kilohertz, we now are at 0.06 picofarads or 60, excuse me, 62 femtofarads as opposed to 18 femtofarads. What can we do to get this down closer to 18? Well, the answer to that is we got to change our terminating impedance. If we change our terminating impedance to about 200 ohms and we set the analysis to plot our SWR with the 200 ohm load also, let's look at the schematic. 15.5 femtofarads. That's really close. 7.9 millihenries. We're, we're, get, we're awful close here. Let's plot this now and see what we get. It's too narrow again. Let's go back. 14.2. Let's go to, to say, 14.4. Um, see what that looks like. Nice a little better. We now see a loss of 1.2 dB in the... In the, in the 1.2 dB. And it looks pretty good. But we still, <clears throat> we now have too little of a, too little of a uh, capacitance here. So we need to do something to make the capacitance larger. We can either vary the bandwidth a little bit, or we can vary the impedance here. 200 was a little bit too much. Let's try about 180 ohms and see what that does for us. 17.3, not quite there yet. Maybe 170 ohms. 18.3. This is very good. Let's set the analysis to be 170 ohms here for SWR. Let's set our, let's look at our plot. Let's look at our, set our bandwidth to be a little bit narrower. So it's 14.3, so we'll do 14 point, um, say 27 to 14.33. Plot this. And that's an awfully good looking filter. Good SWR. Good filter, and if we look at the schematic, all of these values are very close to the crystal parameters we measured before. This would be a very good starting place to use for a uh, crystal filter. Now we can go and tweak on these a little bit and make them exactly match our circuit, but this circuit is exactly the kind of circuit we're going to build. We're going to match 50 ohms to 170 ohms here, crystal 1. A capacitor, crystal 2, a capacitor, crystal 3, a capacitor, crystal 4, a capacitor, crystal 5, and a load. And we're done. So hopefully um, this has been interesting. Uh, we will use a different program to design the filter for real, but it's interesting that we can get LC to give us the answers uh, that we want. This is one of the weaknesses in the crystal, and that is the fact that we have uh, you can set the frequency, but when you do that, you get both of these at the same time. And you can, you don't buy a, an 18 femtofarad capacitor and a 6 millihenry inductor, 6.7 millihenry inductor. You buy them as a set. And because of that, you have to play games with uh, the bandwidth. Notice if we change the bandwidth here to, say, 3 kilohertz, just for grins, and look at the, um, look at the plot, uh, no, look at the schematic. We're down 13 femtofarads. So at 13 femtofarads, we'd ha now have to drop the impedance down again. So we'd have to drop this down, say, to like maybe 100 ohms. And then look at the schematic again. Now we're back to 23. So, so we, we have to kind of play back and forth, back and forth. But uh, hopefully this has been instructive. At this point, you might be 
wondering how can all these crystals that are tuned to the same frequency give us a bandwidth of four kilohertz? Why doesn't the bandwidth just uh, why isn't the bandwidth just a hundred hertz or something like that? And the answer is that these crystals, if we look at all the digits here, they really aren't all tuned to the same frequency. They're tuned to different frequencies. We see it in the last digit down here. But LC, as, as is SimSmith, really isn't designed for crystal filters. And if, they, if LC um, had done more digits here and printed out more digits here, we would have seen that they, they are different frequencies. And how do they become different frequencies? It shows here as if they are different. We're not going to make them different. Uh, we're not going to buy crystals that are just a teeny bit different to do our filter, as we will see later. We will add an additional capacitor to tune the crystal. Uh, which we'll do in the next video. And the purpose of these capacitors will be explained also. The purpose of these capacitors is to help isolate the stages so that the benefit we see from crystal one to crystal two um, increases more than what you would expect if they were just in series. So with that, I'd like to say um, this is the end of the vid first video and stay tuned for part two. Thank you very much.